ಆಂದ್ರಿಯಾದೋ ಭಾವಾಹಾನಾ ಪೃಥಿಕ್ಷಮಾ ಸಂಧಮಾತ್ರೇಣ ಸೋಹಮಿತ್ಯಾವಧಾರಯ I am he the one because of whose presence alone the inert entities like the body and the senses are able to function through acceptance and rejection anapanna vikara sannayas kantava devayaha udhyading shalayet prat yakshohamityavadharaya i am he the one changeless innermost self that moves the intellect etc as a magnet does iron filings ajadatmavadabhanti yat sangnidhya jada api ೇಹೇಂದ್ರಿಯಮನಾಹಮಿತ್ಯಾವಧಾರಾ ಐ ಆಂ ಹಿ ದ ಒನ್ ಎಂಟಿಟಿ ಇನ್ ಹೂಸ್ ವೈಟಲ್ ಪ್ರೆಸೆನ್ಸ್ ದ ಬಾಡಿ ಸೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ರಾಣಸ್ ದೋ ಇನರ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ದಮ್ಸೆಲ್ವಸ್ ಅಪೀರ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಕಾನ್ಶಿಯಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡೈನಾಮಿಕ್ ಎಸ್ ದೋ ದೇ ಆರ್ ದ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ನಮಸ್ತೆ So, three beautiful and powerful verses from Vakya Vritti. Vakya means, of course, the Maha Vakya, that thou art. You are Brahman. And Vritti means the actual meaning and especially the life, way of life, based on it. So, because the meaning of any spiritual term is the actual being, the state of being in which one realizes it. So there's something I want to point out about these three verses. In each of them, the Sanskrit contains the phrase, Soham hamitya vadharaya, Soham, I am that. I am him, actually. Him I am. Saha, I am. Soham, aham, I am. So like that. And then iti, this, avadharaya, means to conclusively understand. Not just an ordinary understanding, but like you really deeply get it. to the point where you can base your whole being on it. You can bet the farm on it. You know that it's going to work for you. I would call this confidence. Knowledge that the Vedic wisdom is true in every respect. Gathered from one's own experience. Of course, to do that, first you have to have enough faith in the Vedas to actually try them. <laughs> But once you do and you're convinced that they are real, that they are the truth, then you can conclude, this much is true. This I know by my own experience. So now this changes the whole mood of the translations. Huh? Let's go over the three verses for context. When one is firmly convinced, I am he, the one because of whose presence alone the inert entities like the body and the senses are able to function through acceptance and rejections. When I am fully convinced that I am he, the one changeless innermost self that moves the intellect etc as a magnet does iron filings when i am fully firmly convinced with confidence that i am he 
the one entity in whose vital presence the body, senses, mind, and pranas, though inert in themselves, appear to be conscious and dynamic, as though they are the self, when I am fully convinced of that, then what? Well, the Vedas teach the well-being of life, not only in this body, in this body as a preparation for the next life. In other words, the sacrifices and sadhanas and austerities and so forth are not only for the purification and sanctification and elevation of this life, and not only do they provide results such as opulence, knowledge, beauty, peace of mind, wisdom, and so on and so on, in this life, but they continue to provide those benefits once earned in the following life, in the next life. Now, when does the next life begin? Immediately upon when the soul exits the body. Now, we go through this every night in sleep. When we fall asleep at night, the living being exits the body and becomes conscious only of the mind, the thoughts and the dreams in the mind. And what are these based on? Memory and desire. So similarly, when one leaves the body at death, one finds oneself in this same consciousness, svapna consciousness, consciousness of thoughts and dreams, and still possessed of desires from what one was unable to achieve in the previous life, and from habitual impressions generated over many, many lifetimes, one still desires certain forms and actions, names and designations. Therefore, as best that I can make out from the Upanishads, the first stage after death, even for one who is realized, is that one enters the dream state and then whatever desires one has, one dreams, experiences as a dream in that state. When one is fully convinced that I am not the body, that I am the living entity, the conscious being within, Atma, ultimately Brahman, now, if, if one still thinks that, oh, I'm the body and I need a body and I'm an individual and all of that, then he goes to the moon and the whole different sequence of things happen. Still based on the same principles, but I'm talking about one who is realized. Uh, because the Vedas, the, the Upanishads, uh, teach this as a special case. That for one who is realized... He remains stable in that state of svapna until all of his desires have been discharged, have been experienced, have been satisfied. Now, how do we know this? Because the desires that one brings along with one when leaving the body, either in sleep or at death, then he continues to bring those into sushupti consciousness. And sushupti is, for all practical purposes, a shiva. One becomes shiva or like shiva to the extent that his desires automatically manifest in dreams, in thought. Now, if one has become purified of the urge to have a physical body, one can experience all of these desires unlimitedly in the, not spiritual body, but the intelligence, the vijnana mayakosha, in the state of svapna. But actually, one is situated in sushupti and only comes out into svapna to dream. Now, 
than when all the desires have been satisfied up to the individual's satisfaction. Then one becomes settled in sushupti, and there is only one desire left, that is to merge with Brahman. So that is the next stage. That happens pretty much automatically, although, you know, from our point of view on planet Earth, it may take what we think of as a long time. But since there are no objects and no changes in Sushupti, it doesn't seem like any time at all. Or rather, it's an ungraspable, immeasurable amount of time. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like when you go into deep sleep at night and then you wake up. It's like no time at all has passed. But time has passed. <laughs> so in the same way, these processes at the time of death are what brings the enlightened being to full realization of nirguna Brahman. It doesn't happen right away. It can't happen right away. Because we are still dragging around with us, you know, and anybody who tries to meditate will experience this. We, we're still dragging a whole bag of desires from the things that we wanted in this life to try to adjust or compensate for the lacks and the traumas and so on of not only this life, but previous lives too and the likes and preferences and so on that one created in those lives comes forward into the present life as taste. And so the desires are based on these tastes and they will not go away uh, because they are actually the substance of the mind. These big desires, big thoughts. One has to experience them. For them to go away. Mere suppression will not work. Oppression, suppression, trying to uh, control the mind, you know, like uh, the example is given of a calf tied to a pole. The calf only has so much rope, right? A couple of yards maybe. So the calf will walk around and around the post until the rope winds up and it can't go anywhere. And then it'll turn around after it figures this out, of course, for a while it's going to cry. But then once it figures it out, he'll walk the other way around and around the post <laughs> until the same thing happens. Or the example is given of a bird tied with a string to a perch. That is, every time the bird tries to fly away, it can only fly for the length of the string tied to its leg or something like that. And then it has to come back, and the only place to sit is on the perch. So it becomes trained to sit on the perch, just like the calf becomes trained to be tied up to the post without struggling. Then it can be milked later on. So in the same way, the mind tries to escape any kind of discipline enforced upon it. It has to be convinced, or rather the intelligence has to be convinced, and show the mind a steady determination that, okay, we're not going to do things in the same old way now. We are going to live according to this spiritual knowledge, not simply the animal desires. The animal desires aren't going away. We're still going to eat and sleep and all of that. Take care of the body nicely. But we just don't need to chase after all those big desires in this life. We don't need to waste our energy trying to get all these big, big things. Huh? The perfect marriage, the perfect relationship, the perfect friendship or the perfect business or whatever it is. We don't have to run around and, and exhaust ourselves. We can sit calmly in one place and meditate with the confidence, knowing that when we leave this body, 
we will get to experience everything we desire. Now, that is the actual teaching of the Upanishads. I've just spent, you know, weeks and months <laughs> researching the Upanishads. And that particular wisdom, if you want to look it up, comes from the uh, eighth canto, the end part, last part of the Chandogya Upanishad. So if you want to verify it, look it up. But that is what it teaches, happens after the time of death in the next body and so on. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.